Welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show with Steve Cohen. Our special guest today is Mr. Stan Goldstein. Stan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. Pleasure to be on. I've listened to quite a few of them, and uh, I'm honored to be a guest. Well, you know, you and I have known each other for a very long time. We're both really young, and <laughs> we'll get to that. But um, what I'd like to talk about, I, I, I want to get to know you a bit. Talk about where you grew up, and I'm sure you'll be enthusiastic to do that. And talk a little bit about your mom and dad. Right. Well, I grew up in a town called Neptune, New Jersey. It's uh, on the Jersey Shore, just um, right next to a town called Asbury Park. That's pretty well known. And um, my dad had a liquor store growing up and uh, worked part time in the liquor store. But I always remember, um, you know, it was funny. Kids always wanted to drink alcohol when they were younger and stuff. I mean, in their teens, I'm talking about like 16, 17. It was always around with me. So it was never a big deal. And I, and I never drank it. But my dad had a liquor store in town, worked six days a week, worked hard. And remember, never had many vacations. My mom helped him out the liquor store uh, a lot. And uh, I have all great memories from childhood. I know some people don't. All my childhood memories are very, very good. And uh, I had a chance to own the liquor store, but then I decided against it. I didn't really want to do it. It could have been my dad would have turned it over to me, but I decided to go in another direction. And um, I think that turned out pretty well <laughs> so far. Talk about... Uh... I just want you to talk a little bit about high school because I want to know what kind of kid were you growing up? I always loved sports. I remember uh, the Mets winning the World Series in 69. I can never play sports well, though, but I love sports. <laughs> I love being around. My high school basketball team was very, very good. They were always ranked high in the state. And for me, I remember my oldest sister would take me to games. She was six years older than me. And for me, when I was about 12, I would go to Neptune High School basketball games. And to me, that was like seeing the Knicks. I got the guys autographs and everything. I mean, they, they, they were, that was such a thrill to me that I was like around them and everything. And, uh, but I, I love sports. Um, I was always a pretty good student. I always loved newspapers. I always, back then, they always said new, you could have like the New York newspapers delivered to you in class. And I always, people always remember, I always had a newspaper on my desk reading and everything all the time. The teachers probably weren't too happy as I was probably <laughs> thumbing through a newspaper and not paying attention to class. But uh, when I got to high school, like I said, I was never good enough to play sports, but I loved being around it. So I became the statistician for the soccer team in the fall, the basketball team in the winter, and then the baseball team in the uh, spring. So I got three letters every year, but I never played a sport, but I did get three varsity letters. And had my varsity jacket and everything. I was real proud, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would always love a sports. Uh, you're leaving high school. Talk about your college decision. And I want you to talk about uh, you basically your college experience. I lo love sports. I found out um, in what guy I went to high school with that you, you were familiar with. Actually, I didn't go to high school with him. He was uh, with my oldest six, sister. He was six years older than me. A guy by the name of Bill King. He became the PR director of the Milwaukee Bucks. And that sort of hit me like, wow, if someone from my high school got a job in the NBA, it's possible I could get a job in the NBA or work, you know, go, go into pro sports that way. And when I was a senior in high school, I found St. John's University in Queens, New York, had an athletic administration program. And I went up, that was the only school I visited, talked to them and got accepted right away. I think I got accepted of October that year. So I already had my plans. I wanted to go there and I didn't know too much about the school. I knew Lou Carnesecca and they were a very good basketball team. And um, so I went, I went to New York and uh, Queens had my, car broken into my first week there. So they finally stole it my junior year, but that's another story. But uh, I majored in athletic administration and um, had a great four years there. Um, was I didn't, I didn't be, become a statistician with the basketball team or a manager uh, with any of the sports there, but I went to the school newspaper 
and I was the sports editor there for a few years. So I got to travel with the men's basketball team with Lou Carnesecca, who was great. And um, then I covered baseball too. Frank Viola, who later pitched for the Minnesota Twins and the Mets, and John Franco, who pitched for the Mets. They were they were uh, at St. John's with me. And Chris Mullen was a freshman my senior year. So I had, I had a great experience at uh, St. John's. I had a real good time. I, I, I got to ask, talk about your best basketball year that you watched when you were there. Well, um, probably would have been my sophomore year. St. John's was ranked as high as number seven, I believe. And one of your uh, – former teammates, Reggie Carter was the leading senior on that team. And there was, I'll never forget. We had a great Saturday afternoon basketball game in February. It was on NBC against Syracuse and they were our big rival and Syracuse was number two in the country. St. John's was number seven and St. John's was up by one and had a one and one with seven seconds left. The guy named Bernard Wrencher missed the free throw. And then a guy I would get to know, and you still know very well, Louis Orr goes down the court for Syracuse, puts a layup in with no time left on the clock, although as he smashes into Reggie Carter, they call it the foul on Reggie Carter, and uh, Syracuse one by one. But all my years with the Knicks, I always called Louis, and I still will to this day if I see a Mr. Offense foul. It was sort of a joke we had. But they had some great teams at, at St. John's. It was always great being around Luke Carnesecca. He always had great quotes and everything. And I'll say this. I, you know, I was, I was in college, and he was always very patient with me because I'm sure some of the questions I asked were very dumb questions. You know, he was around the New York media, but here I was. college kid. But he always was very patient and was always very nice. And I'll never forget, I um, wanted to set an interview up with him to write about one of the years, uh, the preseason, we did a big feature. And I went over to the office and his secretary says, oh, we can talk to you right now. I was like, oh, right now. I wasn't even prepared. <laughs> it was like, walk in, but as nice as could be, very friendly, asked questions about me, where I was from. And uh, no, St. John's had some great experiences there. I saw some great basketball. It was when the Big East was first starting. And it was, um, I was there right at the start of the Big East, was at the first Big East tournaments and everything. And even before Patrick Ewing and then Chris Mullen sort of became the big names, but it was a lot of fun. He did he lend you any sweaters? <laughs> that was right after I got out. That was the uh, '85 season with the sweater. That's amazing how that took off. <laughs> really quite, quite there. <laughs> it was quite something, Louis. Okay, you're about to leave St. John's. <laughs> Talk about your first job. Well, my first job actually, I always uh, like newspapers, as I was saying. So my senior year of high school, which would have been 1977-78, I used, as I said, I was like the statistician and manager for the sports teams. And part of the job was we would call in the scores to the local newspaper, to the Asbury Park Press, and give the report. You know, it, whether it was basketball, giving the box score, who had so many points and all that. And I had done that my sophomore and junior years. And my senior year, September 1977, uh, I guess they liked me because they said, you do good. We'd like you to come work for us. And this was the Asbury Park Press. And I was thrilled. I mean, here I am going to my senior high school and the local newspaper wants me to work for them for a big $2 an hour. <laughs> so, but I, I, you know, I was thrilled. I was gaining experience with a daily newspaper. I don't know where I had the energy and time to do all this as I look back now, because I was still going to school. I was still do, involved with the sports teams and somehow I was working just about every night of the week and weekends with them. But I always had a love for newspapers and writing and, and getting, hey, getting to go to games and getting paid for it was thrilling. And um, I worked for the Asbury Park Press my uh, all through college too, through uh, all the summers uh, I was at St. John's. And then finally my senior year at St. John's, they had internship programs. And this would have been this January of 1982. I interned with the Knicks. And that's where I probably first met you when I started there in the PR department. And, uh, you know, I was thrilled because as a kid, I, you know, and, and it actually wasn't that long ago. As I look back now, I mean, it was 1982. So it was just about 12 years earlier. The Knicks had won the championship, Willis Reed, Walt Frazier. And all of a sudden I was, I was there. Red Holzman was still the coach. And it, it was quite the thrill to be around there. So talk about your first year 
uh, working for the Knicks because you had to move, you had to live, or did you live in Manhattan? Uh, I, I, How did you make that transition? I took the train every day. There's a North Jersey coastline here from the Jersey Shore. It goes right into Penn Station in New York. You know, one advantage of working in Madison Square Garden, you're right above the train station. So where others in Manhattan would have to go another 20 minutes to half hour by subway, I just walked upstairs, which is brilliant. So I, I started as an intern. It was um, the 1981-82 season which uh, wasn't one of the better ones for the Knicks, but that was you and Michael Ray Richardson. And uh, I think Maurice Lucas was there that year. <laughs> and they, and um, I think they brought Paul Westfall in. And uh, I, I, I'll always remember this. You'll remember the guy. His name was John Hewitt. He was the PR director. And I was the intern. And I, I was just, like, again, thrilled to be part of this. Even though I wanted to do a great job, I still had stars in my eyes, like, wow, I'm with the Knicks. I'm in the NBA. And they had signed Paul Westfall to a contract. So John Hewick invited me to go to Smith and Walensky Steakhouse with Paul Westfall and two writers, Nat Gottlieb and Tom Greer. Nat Gottlieb was with the North Star Ledger. Tom Greer was with the New York Daily News. And we're at the steakhouse. It's just this one, two, three, five of us. And I'm like, you know, I realized this is what expense reports are, that John Hewitt is taking us out to this very expensive steakhouse in New York. And here I am sitting with the newest Nick and two of the reporters and uh, having a great steak and it's all being paid for. And I'm like, I can enjoy this life. I think I could like this life very much. So and I stayed on with the Knicks. They kept me on. Uh, the general manager was a guy by the name of Eddie Donovan, who I'm sure you remember. And he liked me. And he said, I think I may have a job for you because the internship was only supposed to go to like January to May when the season was over early April. And he said, I, I may have a job for you. I'm looking for an assistant. So I was like, yeah, that sounds good to me. And you asked about, did I live in Manhattan? No, they were paying me $150 a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> and even in, even almost 40 years ago, that wasn't getting you anything in Manhattan. It wasn't getting you anything in Jersey either. So I still lived at home the whole time. And um, then, <laughs> then uh, I remember I was supposed to only be on for a month. And that month went by and no one said anything to me. So I kept coming to work and they kept paying me. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't until a guy, you'll remember Mel Wall, he was the big uh, finance guy there. He said, they've been paying you this whole time? He goes, yeah, he goes, we have to make you full time then. So the next year they made me a full time employee. I think that was uh, 1982, 83 season, or 83, 84 season. So that was really thrilling for me. And I, I just remember coming up in a Manhattan every day and uh, taking the train in and it thrilled me. I remember just walking through the doors of Madison Square Garden. It was like, I don't know if you as a player, for me, it was like, oh, my God, I'm working at Madison Square Garden. I'm 22 years old. I'm working at Madison Square Garden. This is such a thrill. It really was. <laughs> Talk about your first game that you saw at the Garden with uh, John Condon on the, announcing the game. And yeah. I mean, these guys are legendary, at least for yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I started, um, I, I wasn't on the stat crew then. I was just working the games like we would help the press people set up. We would get quotes after the games and things like that. And then I think it was my second year there. The guy who was the official scorer had to go somewhere else. So and you remember another and Carl Martin says to me, you want to be the official scorer? I'm like, yeah. I mean, here I did the official start high school. I didn't do it at St. John's. And all of a sudden, I'm the official scorer at Madison Square Garden. I'm sitting next to John Condon, a guy I grew up listening to who's a legend. He was the PA announcer at the Garden. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena. <laughs> and, and it was just a thrill. And I, I was always pinching myself like, wow. And I was the official scorer for five years or so. I, I, I did the big St. John's Georgetown game back in uh, 85, the Chris Mullen, Patrick Ewing game, number one against two. I was official scorer for the Big East tournament for four years. And I had the best seat in the house, center court <laughs> right there. So that was such a thrill. But, it, you know, I grew up a Knicks fan and it was just such a thrill always to be right there. And then Dave DeBusher became the GM. So here I'm working for one of the guys I grew up practically worshiping and I'd be in the office and uh, Walt Frazier would walk in and Willis Reed would walk in. And it's like, I'm, 
I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> Not much, but still, I'm getting paid to do this. This, this is, this is something. This is a lot of fun. And I, and I, and I think as you know, I got along with most of the players too. I, uh, you know, uh, I'll tell you another quick story. Paul Westfall again, who sadly just uh, passed away not too long ago. But when he first started with the Knicks, I was just there and he told me, um, you know, I have all this fan mail and I haven't answered it. He goes, I'll tell you what, can you can we sit down in the office one afternoon? I must have 300 letters. Will you organize it all for me? And there were mostly people wanting his autograph basketball cards. And he says, um, organize it all for me and we'll sit down and I'm going to sign every single card. I want you to put them in the envelopes and mail them back to the people. So we sat there and like, I'm, I'm a guy who always collected autographs. I wrote to players as a kid myself. And here I'm like, now I'm a part of this. And I remember he gave me like $300 too. And I'm like, it's too good to be true. This is just wonderful. <laughs> so sit down. And I was thrilled too, that like where I used to write to players here was Paul making sure I was thinking that every envelope I sealed, some kid was going to open that and be thrilled that they got their basketball card autographed by Paul Westfall as it went on. Talk about, um, talk about how long you actually worked for the Knicks. I talk worked for some of your other favorite players besides my, myself. Of course. Besides you. <laughs> besides Bill. Now, Bill, Bill was always great. I heard Mike Saunders on one of your uh, podcasts. And Mike said you were one of the best guys, which is true. And uh, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second. But I remember looking at Marty Blake's reports. Marty Blake used to be the scout for the NBA who scouted all the college players. And even though I didn't work for the Knicks when you got drafted in 1979, I was going back. He used to put these binders together. Now I'm sure it's all computerized and analytics and everything else. But back then it was the binders of all these players with their opinions on the player and what they thought. And I remember reading Bill's. And it just said, he's a very nice person. <laughs> so, and, and I remember saying, I go, yep, he got that right. He's a very nice person. So, but um, I worked for the Knicks. It would have been January of 1982 to, matter of fact, we're in August, August of 1987. I worked in that time. I worked for four different general managers, Eddie Donovan, Dave DeBusher, Scotty Sterling for a short time, who I really liked. And then a guy by the name of Al Bianchi came in. And he decided he was going to let, I mean, the front office back then was very small. Now these teams have hundreds of people. We had like eight people in the front office. But Al Bianchi decided he wanted to bring his own people in. So I was 27 years old and I was let go. And um, But I, um, but during that time I worked, uh, Red Holzman was the first coach, Hubie Brown. I was there for all of Hubie's years. And then um, Bob Hill for the last year. And as far as players, I was there during the Bernard King era, which was a lot of fun. Um, Bernard, he was, at, and you were there too, was uh, one of the top players in the game before he tore his knee up. And uh, that was always thrilling to work with Bernard. And then I was there for Patrick Ewing's first two years. So, and I'll never forget the draft lottery. Uh, Sunday afternoon, 1985, was at the Waldorf Astoria. And you might have felt a little differently because it was your position. But, um, it was just a thrill. I mean, I, that, at that point, it, it hit me like that's what it's like to win a real lottery. I mean, when the Knicks won it, it was just ecstatic how it was. You know, it, it was like we, were, we thought we were going <laughs> to win a bunch of championships, but Patrick had a great career anyway. But no, I like Patrick. I, I always got along with him. I got along with most of the guys. And uh, – Rory Sparrow, very, very well. I got along well with the coaches. And, um, I, you know, I look back now, I was young, probably a wise ass at times, but I think people kept me in my place. And Mike Saunders was always excellent, too, to work with. Uh, Mike was the trainer of the Knicks, and he, he, Mike taught me a lot. Matter of fact, I started traveling with the team my last year there, and Mike said, I don't care, triple confirm buses and everything. They may think you're the biggest pain in the neck, but you know what? You're going to get it right. And there's never going to be a problem. And I'll never forget that. He taught me that. And Bill, you were always great too. You were always wonderful. I may have snuck you some extra tickets at times. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got to handle the tickets. That, that was one thing, like, here I am, 23, 24 years old, and Eddie Donovan says, you're going to handle all the tickets now, which meant I handled all the player tickets. 
So I organized them and then the players needed extra tickets or something like that. I worked it out. And uh, before you played with Michael, Michael Jordan in Chicago, when Michael, his first few years came in with the Bulls, he always needed like, cause it was New York, 20 different tickets. And this would have been his first two or three years in the league. And when the Bulls were in New York, I would always sit down with Michael before the game and his, I knew someone who worked for his agent very well and they would all arrange it. And he paid, he paid for everything too. It wasn't anything free, but I would always sit down with Michael with like a 20 different tickets and say, all right, these are your two best ones. Your top people go here and just go in like a private room with them by the dressing rooms and sort it all out. And, uh, yep. Gave me one of his pair of Air Jordans after a game and signed them to me too. And I sold them to someone back then and big regret now. <laughs> <laughs> Huge. Yes. Hey, what, hey Stan, talk about um, what was it like for you? Uh, because this was uh, something that's big now. All the celebrities in the stands. That that was always fun. And handling the tickets, I would get calls too. I remember getting a call from Elliot Gould, from Pearl Bailey, from Peter Falk. And that was always thrilling to look around and see who, who was at the games. And uh, Woody Allen was there all the time. Dustin, oh, Dustin Hoffman was there. Dustin Hoffman was another one who called. I got to get, know his personal assistant real well. And I remember they invited me to a premiere and everything. Like I said, this is, I might not have been making a lot of money, but I was living this New York City lifestyle and stuff. So I, I got invited to a premiere of one of Dustin's movies. And I helped him get tickets for his kids to Sesame Street Live, which was playing at what was then called the Felt Forum at the Garden. And that was always fun. I know I remember Bill Cosby was always around our games, too. And then I remember one night looking up and there's Jack Nicholson and Diane Keaton sitting together. My biggest thrill, though, of them all, and I was the official scorer, but I just turned around and looked, and there was Cindy, Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte sitting together right up, uh, right up above the tunnel. And that was like, wow, <laughs> that, that hit me. And something. Bob Dylan was at one of our games, I remember, too. He was sitting there with Bill Graham, the promoter from San Francisco. They were sitting there. One of the guys go, I think that's Bob Dylan. I go, yeah, that's Bob Dylan. So that was, that, you know, it, it was always thrilling to see who might be around. And, uh, of course, you know, when you, the Lakers were in town or, or the Bulls with Michael, that's when the big celebrities came out always. So, But Woody Allen was there all the time. I remember that. And Dustin Hoffman was there a lot, too. John McEnroe was around a lot, always. Yeah, I can definitely remember a lot of the, uh, not that we had an opportunity to uh, talk to anybody, but uh, there was usually somebody around, whether they were uh, an actor, actress, uh, athlete. Uh, so mm. it was uh, really impressive. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, mean, I remember handling the tickets for a lot of them too. And it was, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll even give you another, this is an NBA player story. Yeah, the so Lakers only came in once a year. And Kareem was looking for, he said, I, who can I talk to? I need a real good seat behind our bench. And I happened to have one in my pocket and someone put them to me. And I know he was one of your idols and like, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> it's like, he comes to me and says, oh, I'm, I hear you can help me out. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, I don't like, again, I'm just thrilled to be doing this. And he had an autobiography out. I said, sure, I'll give you the ticket. Will you sign your book for me? He goes, absolutely. I'd be thrilled to. So yeah, he signed his book and for Stan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and uh, gave him a ticket to, to use for uh, right behind. But, you know, again, and I remember Magic Johnson even, he's like, here, can, oh, I guess I could tell the story. Magic even came in. He gave me a phone number. He said, can you call this woman for me and just tell her you'll leave her two tickets for me? So I was calling. We didn't have cell phones then, but there was the phones back by the locker rooms. I was trying to reach this woman for magic. Like, here, he's going to leave you two tickets under that name. So, but yeah, it was always thrilling, Bill. It was always a lot of fun. And uh, I only was there for five and a half years. And, uh, but I still cherish all those memories. And matter of fact, when, um, the, with the COVID-19, with the pandemic, with the games not being played here in New York, the Madison Square Garden Network ran a lot of the old games they were showing and it brought back memories. You in a Knicks uniform and there I was sitting center court and everything. So it was things I hadn't seen in years that I didn't know that film still existed. Stevie? I think there's a lot of questions I have to ask you. Uh, one has 
Did Bruce Springsteen ever go to Madison Square Garden? <laughs> For a game? You know, it was when Bill was with the Bulls, he said to me, it was a Sunday afternoon game, and I remember – um, Bill left me tickets and I remember he said, your guy was at the game. I said, who? He goes, Bruce. And he goes sitting right behind our bench. And I go, I didn't even see him. He goes, Hey, he was there the whole time. So that would have been after I was there, but one, my last year there, I did get tickets for who's, who's, who is Bruce's wife now, Patty Scaffa. She knew the trainer of the Boston Celtics very well. And he came to me and said, are, are you a Bruce Springsteen fan? I said, oh, yeah, very much so. He goes, you know who Patty Scaff is? I said, of course. He goes, well, she'd like to come to the game. And, again, I had some tickets in the pocket, and uh, she was front row behind uh, right off the court. She came to a game one night. And uh, so that was fun. But never Bruce himself. But that would have been something. And I guess I'm jumping the gun because I know you are a big Bruce Springsteen fan. And could you – Catch us up to what you were doing since you were at the Garden. Since I was at the Garden, well, I left. Gosh, time flies. So I left the Garden in 87, and I went back into newspapers. I worked for the Asbury Park Press. And over the last, um, Which that time of. Springsteen's hometown. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Asbury Park, yeah. Well, it's Freehold is his hometown, but this is his whole area. The whole area I'm from is Springsteen crazy. So, and I've always, I always liked Bruce. And I'll get into that in a little bit, um, sort of what I do with that. But I went back to work for newspapers. I worked for Esray Park Press. I worked for another newspaper, the Home News Tribune. Then sort of I got called up to the big leagues. The big paper here in New Jersey called the North Star Ledger actually came after me in 1999 and offered me a job for a lot more money I was making. And it was almost like, not that the others were AAA, I'm not saying that at all, but it was also like a jump from AAA to the big leagues. And it was like, wow, making really good money here. And uh, I worked there for 19 years. And then newspaper jobs, as you probably know, really went downhill. So I survived a bunch of layoffs, but I got laid off there in um, September of 2018 at the end of that. So I took it as long as I could. And now I work for... Um, Magazines that cover the funeral service industry. <laughs> yeah. American Funeral Director Magazine and American Cemetery and Cremation Magazine. Matter of fact, I was just in a convention last week in Dallas uh, for funeral directors. And Bill, I showed you, I met Drew Pearson of the Cowboys was at this convention. So that was a yeah. lot. Of yeah. Some, somehow I feel like there's some kind of a joke in this, but I'll just leave it alone. People, <laughs> people are dying to get into that publication. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, yeah, we're we're trade magazines, but what you learn is, um, you know, you know, everyone has dealt with funeral directors at one time or other, unfortunately, but they're there, and you know, we there's a lot of interesting stories there. We do features on uh, famous funerals and things like that. I wrote about Kobe Bryant's funeral service. I wrote about Hank Aaron's funeral service. Just all the pageantry that's involved with it, and things, and the prayers, and the people who show up. So. Yeah, it's been interesting. Sports too. <laughs> but I also but I also think that a lot of rabid sports fans have interesting funerals, right? They want to be yeah. buried with their jersey on or you know, stuff like that, right? Have you yeah. encountered that? Yeah, they have even caskets that have the team logos on them and everything. And then they'll even want the theme song played or they want everyone to show up in uh, the team's uniforms. I wrote a story on it was a dog, a mascot for the Cleveland Browns died. And a funeral home in the Cleveland area had a special pet funeral for him. And all these Cleveland Brown fans showed up wearing their brown jerseys and everything. So there's a lot of interesting stories there. And, um, and cemeteries, too, are very welcoming to people, especially during the pandemic. Uh, they're like parks. Go through, enjoy them. There's beautiful artwork and beautiful sculptures throughout and uh, a lot of cemeteries are very welcoming to people like come visit us and uh, not even so much for the great just see what we have here fountains and lakes and have a picnic here i do want to change gears here for a second <laughs> and um let's talk about this one thing that you were doing that i thought was interesting that you did since you love bruce we shouldn't say you like bruce you love bruce but you you did a, a, a bruce tour uh, that I thought was really interesting and curious. Yeah. I've always been a tourist myself. I love seeing places. Um, 
whenever I visit somewhere, I like to go tour on tours and, and just see different things. I, I, as I said, I live at the Jersey Shore, which is the heart of Bruce Springsteen land. And there's places here that Bruce has written about in songs, that sings about in songs, that still mentions. You mentioned, you mentioned Asbury Park. His first album was Greetings from Asbury Park. Uh, he has a song, Sandy, where he talks about a fortune teller called Madame Marie. There's a bar here called The Stone Pony, which you may have heard of, which is one of the most famous bars in the world. So I, I found that there were a lot of people coming here to the Jersey Shore as tourists to see the sights. And I know when I'm somewhere, I like to see it. So a friend and I started doing tours in 1999. We do a Bruce Springsteen tour of the Jersey Shore. We show you, uh, he had two homes that are still sick, childhood homes that are still standing in a town called Freehold. And we show you where his first childhood home was. We show you where other places that he used to live. There's a house near here. Matter of fact, Bill, not far from Monmouth University, where you used to train. There's a house in Long Branch we call the Born to Run House. Little Cottage, that's where Bruce wrote the entire Born to Run album in 1975. Thunder Road, Born to Run, right in this little house. And there's just a lot of down here. So if I've, since uh, my friend Gene Mickle and I, who Bill knows, uh, since 1999, we've, pro we've given literally thousands of people a tour of the area around here. Uh, and they come from all over the world, Australia, uh, Europe, uh, part of, you know, England and uh, Italy and Spain and uh, South America, <laughs> New Zealand. And um, it's always fun. I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, show the people around because I I'm always enthusiastic about it. And it's like I never want even though you know, I get paid to do it, I never want it to feel like it's a job. It's like I love meeting other fans and showing them these things. And there's different photo ops that they like to do and take pictures. At Bruce's band is called the East Street Band. And he has a song called 10th Avenue Freeze Out. And there's a corner in Belmore, New Jersey which is just south of here up to Beachtown. And there's a corner of 10th Avenue and East Street. So all the Bruce fans like to take their picture at that corner. We call it the Springsteen fans Abbey Road shot, where the, where the Beatles fans cross Abbey Road and take their picture. The Springsteen fans like to take their picture here. And then there's plenty of other places in Asbury Park. And I've written a book about it too, Rock and Roll Tour of the Jersey Shore. So we're on a fourth edition now. Savage. So you are a fan. Yeah. Or are that, you a super fan? And I should have, I've asked you this before, but it's never been answered. How many times have you seen this guy in concert? <laughs> Probably three to 400. <laughs> <laughs> you so, saw yeah, him once. Didn't fan. you see him? You saw him in Toronto, right? I think I saw him twice. Oh, uh, where else? <laughs> So I saw Bruce twice, and I got to tell you, now, I really like Bruce. I think he does a great job. Nobody works as hard as this guy, short of James Brown on stage. Uh, for the first two hours, I'm good. After that, I'm out. The damn concerts are too long. He was hitting I, four. Like three hours. He was hitting four hours uh, five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's yeah. amazing. He is. But he's got too much energy. He <laughs> lost me halfway through the concert. Yeah. And he's on Broadway now. He they re uh, he was on Broadway in 2017, 18. And then just a uh, limited run now, he's back on Broadway for 30 shows. So sort of the uh, first Broadway show again since the pandemic to come back. So, And I'm, I've already seen him once. I'm going a couple more times, too. Of course. Stevie, <laughs> I'm going to give you the last shot. Well, one thing that I know is with you and everything you do, you have a lot of enthusiasm, you know, and I even get, you know, we have similar backgrounds too, Stan, you know, I get a lot of young people asking me about getting into the sports business and we get listeners and viewers about that. So why do you think you were successful and are successful? Uh, I was lucky. I mean, it, it's, it is some luck. It is right place at the right time. Uh, I also worked hard at it, too. I remember being when I was at St. John's University and interning in New York, there was a big snowstorm. But I was able to take the subway into work. And I remember the one person still in the office guys can't believe you're here. And I walked in and I was like, no, you know, I was able to make it in. I wasn't driving. I took the subway in and I was able to make it in. And I remember another time they had stacks of newspapers Back then, way before the internet and everything else, they used to get the newspapers and they were just sitting there. 
And I remember just cutting out every story on the Knicks and putting it in a folder. And then I even like uh, gave the PR director, um, these are the days we were, the Knicks were on the back page, like for a month, they made the back page, you know, three Tuesdays, four Sundays, because this is amazing. So I think you have to work hard. You have to try to do something unique. You have to show the love for it too. And you have to be there. I mean, you know, everybody likes to have fun and goof around, but you really have to show a commitment to it. You know, like I said, I was making, you know, when I, at the newspaper I worked, I was making $2 an hour. And then even my first 15 months with the Knicks, I was making $150 a week, but I stayed with it. I was just thrilled to be a part of it. I think there's a part where that does run out after a while where, you know, the novelty wears out and you do have to make more money, but you just have to show a love for it. You have to show a commitment for it and a dedication for it. And, um, you know, ask, if someone asks you to do something, do it, you know, don't make a met, don't have them ask you twice. And if you don't understand, ask, I know that's simple stuff, but that's things that I always found. But you also took initiative, like you mentioned, you know, like mm-hmm. with some of those examples, right? right? Like you didn't wait to be asked. Right. And the other thing too, if they tell you you're done in a month or you have a month to work, but no one says anything after that month that you're still coming in and you're still getting a check. Still work. <laughs> That's what I did. It's like I, I like this. I'm, I'm not going anywhere unless they tell me to, and no one said a word. <laughs> That's the George Costanza move, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Dan, thank you so much for being on. It was, All right, Bill. It was awesome. my, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be a part of this. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, and we're definitely gonna have to. Uh, now you can take Stan on the, on the tour. I'm not gonna go. Because he's uh, he's in New York, but uh, we definitely got to get you. Got to come back out here, come back out west, and uh, we'll do some uh, San Francisco Giant stuff out here. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. USF Dons. There you go, University of San Francisco. Yes, nice, <laughs> nice. and uh, yeah, Bill and I went to a Giants game a few years ago. At uh, yes, yes, had very good. T- I got the tickets; they were very good seats. And uh, excellent so- seats. Yeah, Arizona Diamondbacks, I remember. Yeah. yeah. And your Sorry. Giants are great this year. Best team in baseball. Yeah, yeah, that's what we expect out here. <laughs> All right, Stan. Awesome.